Has estado tu palo. Gracias. Muy bien hecho, muy bien hecho. I think I know some of you. Some of you know me by now. Um, first thing I'd like to say is thank you. I need to say that because you're here. It is a Saturday night. Some of you are on vacation. And you have chosen to be here with us. So thank you very much. Second thing I'd like to do is explain my name. My full name is Francisco Orlando Agudelo Botero. My mother selected Francisco due to the fact that when I was a little boy, uh, excuse me, during uh, her uh, pregnancy, she um, had a difficult pregnancy. Then she was the uh, devout Catholic, so she asked Francis of Assisi to help her through the gestation period. I was a long, long uh, delivery, almost 24 hours. So when I was born, and I was born okay, all of my brothers questioned that, uh, I was then baptized with the, nom the name of Francisco Orlando Agudelo by my father, Botero by my mother. So throughout my life, I have been known as Orlando Agudelo Botero. I chose to keep my mother's last name because I spent nine months in her body and because she was the conduct for me to come to this world. So I had never dropped her, her name. And that's how it gets a little complicated. So it's Orlando Agudelo, my father's last name, Botero, my mother's maiden name. And at the end of it, all three and an O, Orlando Agudelo Botero. So who knew it was poetic? <laughs> so now, this evening several people have asked me when I started, when I knew that I was going to be an artist. And I have to say, I have never questioned that fact. I never didn't know that I was an artist, that I was an artist. I mean, um, when I was three years of age, I would be kneeling on a wall, on the floor, in front of a wall, and I'd be drawing and drawing and drawing. And my brothers and sisters, I come from a family of 12 children, so my brothers and sisters will be playing and flying kites and soccer and cars and toys. And I was completely independent from all of that. I was drawing. Some of the faces that you will see in my work today appear then. So they are the archetypes of my work. Anytime that I need to focus again, if I take a detour, but I, at one moment I need to go back to that center, I take a canvas and I go through one of my archetypes. And then it becomes very familiar and I center and the next body of work begins. By the time I was five years age, uh, of age, I was asking big questions, a lot of big questions. And the adults sometimes, some of my brothers would ask me to leave the room because they thought I was a precocious kid who thought too big and et cetera. Um, I engaged in, in uh, conversations with adults, and uh, there were conversations that were reserved for especially for adults. By the time I was 12 years of age, my mother passed away. And she passed away leaving 10 children at the time. And uh, my way of mourning her passing was I went into my bedroom and I painted. And I went into my bedroom and I read art books. And when I was reading the art books, I was not interested at all in how they painted. I was interested in knowing why they painted. And then an identification with people that were no longer alive began. And so the first cocoon or cloister in my life took place right there and then. And through my work and through the arts, I was able to cope with the loss of my mother. And every one of us dealt with it differently. My father didn't know what to do with me. 
because of my questions. My brothers were going to medical school and architectural school and other traditional professions, and along came an artist, and I'm number eight of 12. He remarried later on, and he had two more children, so we are a total of 12. And they grew up with us, so we are 12. Um, he decided to send me to boarding school, and he chose the Jesuits. And the Jesuits are known for the, uh, the discipline. So I study in the city of Medellin. And uh, I was there in boarding school for a number of years. And uh, while I was there, one of the priests asked me to do a painting of a mother and child because they wanted to go into an inner city contest. And I did that. And they got first prize. And then we went statewide, we got first prize. Then nationwide, we got first prize. And that was their project, not mine. I just did the artwork. And I always thought that it was something really easy to do. So my father saw that. They put me on a newspaper. And my father read it. And it was a big surprise to him. So he flew to Medellin and went to talk to the directors of the school and told them I was there to be educated academically and not to be uh, trained to be an artist. He was really concerned. So when I, when I finished school, he gave me a choice. I could study architecture um, or I would have to work. Because in his own words, uh, he didn't want pretty boys at home. I was a skinny rail, so I never thought of myself as being pretty at all. At all. But he just, uh, he was a really stern, kind man, good man. And he was being responsible to me. He wanted to make sure that he would structure me and direct me properly, according to his school of thought. And um, I chose to respectfully decline his suggestion, and I decided to paint. So I locked myself up in my bedroom, and I would paint, and I played the guitar, and I played accordion, and I would communicate to, with him through these three art forms. And these three, uh, these two art forms, music and painting. He, we didn't speak very much to each other. We just basically um, would run into each other. I was living in his house. He told me, you have to live here until you're 21 years of age. You will not live before then. And as you are here, you have to do, obey my rules. And I did. But I was painting every night, and I became a night owl. I became nocturnal. And I like the privacy of the night. And the night I found it to be a little bewitching and uh, inspiring. And uh, I created a world that was all my own. At that time, every painting that I was doing, I was selling them. I was selling them to his friends. They were all buying my work, and I was saving my money. And so when I turned, he had told me that I had to live there until I was 21. So when I was 21, I got my passport. I went to the um, American Embassy. I had applied for an English school in Los Angeles, Cambria uh, School for Adults, English as a second language. And they, um, they had accepted me. So I got my visa. I had some savings from my paintings. and. Uh, Nervously, I showed up to his office. I made an appointment. I went there and I sat down. And I told him I was leaving the next day. So I left. Uh, he tried to stop me in every way he could. But eventually, he was the only one who took me to the airport the next day. He hugged me. He kissed me. He told me he admired what I was doing. He said he didn't think the rest of my family would have the guts to do that. But uh, so he just kind of left me up and threw me up into the air so I would fly, knowing my destination point. And we became very good friends after that. And he came to the California. He stayed, I lived in Laguna Beach for many years, 24 years. He used to visit me here, and he attended several of my, or one of my exhibitions. And uh, he used to come over and spend up to three months with me. I didn't have any choice in painting, in the arts. And that's just my nature. There's a young lady who walked in here two days ago, and she says, when did you get started? How did you get started? And I said, nature. 
how, you know, that's just the process. So for many years, I painted and uh, not having received proper training in painting, I didn't know the rules. I still don't know the rules. So I decided to, I needed to express something that was coming to me. So I created my own techniques. And then it began to evolve and evolve. And the art types began to evolve and grow and grow. And then the art market began to, the art, the art galleries began to notice it and then began to um, become a so-called ca uh, professional career. I took that out of my life. And I said, I can't deal with that because when I go into the studio and I put a canvas in front of me and it's white, it's one of the most intimidating things that I can possibly imagine. Regardless of how many years I have painted, um, I still have, have the feeling that I need to, it's a square one, it's the three-year-old. Hi, welcome. I need to mention that throughout the years, there's a gentleman by the name of Glenn Engman, and he was, um, he's responsible for putting my artwork on the map. Um, he, and he met me many years ago, and um, when he presented me with uh, uh, the option of being my agent, my manager, um, I didn't believe him. He was 24 years of, of age, and I thought managers were 40 and some. And uh, he asked me the question one day. He said, I uh, invited me to lunch to a place that used to be here called Suzanne's. And uh, he opened a portfolio and he said, this is what I project for your work. And I told him, how do you think uh, that I can believe this that I see? I said, written words, the wind comes over and takes them away. And then he said to me, because the same way that you can tell me that you cannot tell me that your work 10 years from now is going to be as exciting as it is today. You don't know that either. And I like his answer. And so I went to open the portfolio and he said, don't look at it here. Look at it in the studio. So then I told him, if we're going to work together, you need to learn, to, to learn this about me. Never, ever tell me what to do. It makes sense, the portfolio is here, you're here, so I will open this. Um, eventually, good evening. He started to work with my artwork and he brought it out to the art world. He worked with my work for 27 years and he passed away five, five years ago, six years ago. After he passed away, uh, for many different reasons and out of respect, I closed the studio and I did not paint for five years. Um, the body of work that you're going to be seeing tonight is the first one. Um, during those five years, in 2011, I went to Colombia and I spent time there. And I have a brother who, his name is Fernando, and we're very, very good friends, aside from being very good brothers. And he invited me to travel from the northern part of Colombia, the northern coast, Cartagena, down to the city of Cali, where members of my family live. It was going to be a two and a half, three days trip versus a 45 minutes by plane. But he insisted that we would do the trip. He said that it would be good for me. And so the two of us got in his car and we drove, I drove, he drove, and we went up the mountains, up the Andes. I, grew, I was born in the Andes, and I had seen the Andes, but I had not seen the central branch of the Andes. The Andes mountains come from, from South America, and when it arrives in Colombia, it's placed in three different sections. So we drove, we saw towns, the people, so the flower growers talk to them. So wonderful, wonderful people. I wasn't looking at the folklore. I was looking at the humanity in everyone. And, uh, and it was a wonderful experience. I left Colombia, I came back. I went to Hawaii where I was living. I decided it was time to leave Hawaii. 
So I came over to California and I settled in Newport Beach. And one evening in the studio, I said, it's going to time to go back to, to move forward with the art. So one particular evening, I was in the studio. I go to the studio and I play music. I play a lot of classical music in the studio. And, and I'm organizing paints and brushes and I'm looking at materials. And all of this, it just it becomes present. So when the feeling, thought, and idea of doing a body of work related to Latin America, and more specifically Colombia, got me extremely nervous. And I jumped and I walked back and forth and I was trying to take myself out of doing that. I thought it was a little bit of an extra large project, but the alternative, the option of not doing it was, uh, the alternative was not an option. So I began my research and I took this canvas that we have right here and it's a 60 by 60 canvas. And it was the first piece that went on the, uh, on the easel. I titled it Los Andes, um, The Dream, El Sueño. The entire body of work I titled it, I titled um, Los Andes Festival of the Flowers and you will see why. So this is the first piece and this was, please remember, when I go into a canvas, I go in to explore. I don't like going to the studio to paint. Painting, I think I'd rather play the violin. Painting, it's all right. It's okay. I like creating. I like exploring. I like uh, being challenged. I like being frustrated by the process. And I like the discoveries the realizations, and then the new realities. And uh, I live my life that way. And my artwork, my process, my creative process is that way. And when I am there, I give myself completely to it. So I'm going to show you the first piece, and I'm gonna need the help of this gentleman. And I'm going to do, introduce him in a few minutes. But right now, this is my first interpretation of part of the trip that I did with my brother. And this is the Andes. Los Andes, the dream. Okay, let it fall. Okay. Thank you. This is a very romantic and almost idealistic manner of looking at the Andes, the Andes Mountains. And first of all, the culture, human beings, uh, the education in, the, in charge of this, in the hands of this lady, they all wear a little hat. And you're going to see the little hat in every one of the paintings. So this is their next generation. This is their clock. They get up at the crack of dawn and they go to their flower fields. This is the, one of the flower growers. In the depth uh, of the mountains in the Antis, because of oxygen, it changes colors. So sometimes you see them very green, sometimes very blue, and in the distance you see uh, pinks and purples. Uh, and then I place every one of us here. This is every one of us standing up, pointing out towards the dream, any dream we have. And in this particular dream, the dream is this house temple where the tree of life is present. And then one of the flower growers in uh, jubilation and celebration is announcing the house. The red is optimism. Uh, I am the eternal and perpetual optimist. Uh, I choose to look at everything that is good in life. I choose to look at everything that is good in every one of us. Um, Any time that a thought different from that comes in into my mind, I consciously change it and select something else and therefore it provides some quality of life. And then there's a hint of a sunrise, a new dawn. I'd like to show you my interpretation of the flower growers. In this particular case, I selected to do a diptych, the two canvas, 
to maintain the individual, the individualism in each one. I believe when two people come together and they uh, build life together, um, they should remain the individuals that they were when they first met. And they should nurture the individualism in each one rather than trying to change one another. The relationship is apparent, the connection in their eyes and the romance with, between, among them or between them is also reflected in the flower fields that they cultivate. These are the fields, these are the mountains. The uh, hat, it's part of a ritual which we'll see in a few minutes. So I titled this painting, The Procession of the Nobles. Okay, we're good. Thank you. This is a triptych, and I, ch I, I decided to bring the three generations because of what I was saying earlier, that they are uh, born there, grown there, and they die there. And their life is about flowers, and it's about beautifying the earth. Uh, I have had conversations with many of them in their fields, and there were times in which I look at them and I look at the flower fields and they were one. I wasn't quite sure whether the flowers were the flowers or they were the flowers. And they have a magnificent purpose in life. And uh, they're simple and yet they have a depth and um, interesting way of looking at life. There is a philosophy they have. And this painting, the most challenging thing for me was the time of the day the silence at uh, 4.30, 5 o'clock in the morning, and that had to be established with this color in the background. So these colors was highly important in the painting. If it went a little more blue, then it changed the time. If it went a little more green, it did also. And so it had to be taken in consideration that there was a sunrise. I deliberately placed the family in the center. This is Father and Soul, the ritual of the hat. The father, standing on a solid base, he has accomplished a great deal with himself in life. He has his uh, values established. He is in a position to then direct this young boy his son is placing that hat on him. The boy knows where the authority is coming from. So there is something a little passive about this young boy at that moment. Um, the horizon line and the background, it's about this boy. It's not about the father. The father is already established. And that's where the strength he has comes from. So the horizon line is for the young boy. The sunrise is for him. He is a sunrise. When I see children, and sometimes in Colombia, there is a saying that the people who speak Spanish here know. When I said a little girl, I meet her for the first time, and I see her, and I said, sol naciente, a rising sun. And I see children that way. And so this, this rising sun is for him. And then importantly is these fields, this young boy, this is the space in which he will grow, this is the path he will follow, and which is obviously traced by the parents as they structure the kid at the, at the very beginning. And then very importantly is this tree, the circle of life, and in the tree, the tree of life, inside it's all of the wonderful surprises the life has in store for him. So this is father and soul, son, the uh, ritual of the hat. And the next painting that we're going to see is also very small in physical size, but has romanticism, has a lot of wonderful, a wonderful feeling to it. We saw father and son. Now we're going to see 
mother and daughter. Flower of Colombia. <laughs> The young girl, 13 years old, perhaps 14. She's growing from being a little girl to a woman, a young lady, still holding on to the mother. The mother with her maternal qualities, embracing her daughter, protecting her. The lady, the mother, is in the colors of the Colombian flag, the yellow, the red, and the blue, and the Equatorian flag. Too. And obviously, because uh, it, it deals with uh, that part of the world, then the flowers were of great importance, and I did the background. Um, that is one thing. And secondly, that uh, when we were children, so many kids, on Mother's Day, my father would buy us a lot of flowers and uh, take us into a room, give each one of us a little bunch, and that was our present to our mother. So we'd bring the flowers to her. And every year, she loved the flowers. and. And regardless of who, uh, you know, who was presenting the flowers, she loved every one of them. So dealing with a maternal figure, a universal figure, then I chose to bring the flowers to the background. Okay. Now we're going to go back to the uh, flower growers. And as I said, these these people, these men, get up every single day. This is titled Vocation, done in, in the flower fields. This is one of the archetypes. Vocation, this man was born in the fields, grows in the field, work in the fields. He sees absolutely nothing else in life but the flowers. The color in the flower fields, it's a color of passion, passion they feel. The color, the yellow color of the sunrise is the color of hope, yellow. And him, stern, solid, knows who he is, knows what he wants. He knows his trajectory, the one he's walked and the one ahead. They and night, light and darkness, which every human being has in them. All the fields belong to someone. So I needed to do the landowners, the aristocrat. This is the aristocrat. Also wears the hat. She has a presence. This is Regal proud, she owns the land. The flowers are part of her life. She has access to different clothing as well. She has access to jewelry, to pearl. But she combines this with something that is of the region, of the area, a type of jewelry that is made by the Indians. And uh, when I was earlier explaining my last names, the Aguadalo family will be the men that you just saw. The Botero family will be this. And when my family saw a photo this a photograph of this painting, they immediately reacted and they loved it. I was with this painting for at least six, seven, eight months. And it began to develop into a beautiful little town with the houses and the balconies and the people in the balcony and the street filled with bicycles and people are just at leisure just riding the bicycles. And I kept looking at the painting and I said, it's just absolutely nothing. You know, anybody can do this painting. Uh, so I didn't see myself in the painting. So I put it away. I put it upside down. I wouldn't look at it for a number of weeks and months. Until one day, one night, one of my assistants, I have a rule in the studio, and 
I work with very wonderful people and very loyal people. Um, but I've always asked them, please don't give me your opinion whether you like the painting or not. If I am in the process of creating, this is between the painting and myself. And sometimes I like it, sometimes we don't get along, etc. So, but there was one particular guy who just looked at the painting and he's at the door and he says, Mr. Orlando, it's a beautiful painting. Don't finish it, you should finish it. And he ran out the door. He broke the rule, but okay. He left and that night around one, two o'clock in the morning, I put it in the, I took a big old brush, the one they use for painting walls. It was dirty and I looked at the painting and I thought, I need to do something about this. So I took it from one corner and I went and through the road, changed the path of the road. The road was a really simple little road to Disneyland for me. And I decided no, and I went. And then here it is, the path of the cyclist, El Sendero de los Bicicleteros. Where you see the mountains, the blue mountains, there is a lot of houses buried, and there are a lot of people buried that I had actually painted. And I chose to widen the road, bring it up to the mountains and up to the heavens up above. And then when I did that, I said, that has meaning. Then it has, it has a, a destination point. I also chose to wait into buying the bicycle a little longer, <laughs> yes. And so there's a lot of houses, the road curve right here, these were all houses, there were people in the balconies, houses here, and you didn't really see the mountains. So I opened it up, worked on the road, the cyclists were there, and then I just brought the majestic on this to the painting and gave it space and volume. The next piece is going to be a little challenging, and it is titled um, Knowledge and Imagination. This is knowledge. Now, this is imagination. The chair is the same. The chair is a symbol of life. The individual is outlined exactly the same shape. The difference is the inner and the mental, the school of thought. Knowledge is former, formal, is measured, and the concept of time is of great importance. He sits very straight up, very proper. He wears the hat, outside is the tree of life and he sits comfortably in his library. Imagination. Imagination is free, is informal, is uncomplicated, and it produces it, a freedom for creativity. It gives creativity its wings. Their creativity is expressed through the colors of the hands and feet. The creativity is expressed by having an open mind, removing the hat, throwing it on the floor, being open to all sorts of possibilities. The tree of life becomes the tree of wisdom that produces the books that are written by people with imagination who do the research. And then those books later on eventually go to the library where he reads and where he studies, where he gets well informed and educated. This was fun for me to do. It was, uh, it also came from a conversation with two men in Colombia and they had different ways of looking at a flower field and one was that, and one was this. To me, both of them exist in me. For being an artist, I'm painfully organized and methodic. 
and, um, and structure in so many ways. But I'm very free once I'm in front of a canvas. My life, per se, is actually very structured, very organized. I give myself the freedom to explore and to fly as high as creativity will take me when I am painting. But I need to know that my platform, everything in my personal life, it's solid, it's organized. And I always equate it with the uh, space shuttles. And I look at that platform, the engineer, engineering, it is solid. And then that vessel goes up in an exploration process and it doesn't even shake. So for me to do that and to come back later and to have it discover more and establish more in all these paintings, I need to know my life is very organized. So both of them exist in me. I think both of them hopefully exist in every one of us. And hopefully everyone who fits this profile is aware of this and will be able to, to uh, have a fusion of both and enjoy life tremendously. It is wonderful to be, to be this free, but it becomes more wonderful when there's a sense of organization to that process before you get to this process. Um, the difference between the two are immense, but that one has the concept of time. This one doesn't. Because you really cannot put time to an idea. When a composer writes a song, like Mario does, he can't time, he can't time it when um, someone, when Marie gets an idea, you know, she can't really place time into that. So for that reason, I did without the concept of time in this painting. I was a lot more flexible with this painting. Of the two, this was more difficult to do than that one because the, the opportunities to do incredible, endless things with this piece uh, were many. This is the composer. Thank you. This painting has gone to a private collection as of four o'clock this afternoon. Um, the concept is this. All of us, and in some cases artists and musicians, we work from an emotional state. When the emotions are there, they are not organized whatsoever. Emotions per se, you know, every, every one of us can know when we're very emotional, there's a lack of organization in, the, in that process. We're just emotional and that's, that's a valid you know, feeling and uh, it's fine. The ideal is to find the fusion and the perfect equilibrium between uh, logic and emotion. And when we do that, I think we'll realize ourselves and that we can handle life very, very well. So through a process of emotional being, the love and the passion that creativity brings, and creativity usually emanates from human experiences, human emotions, but through a process of organization and the logic, then it gets organized. This gets organized. The instrument appears. And the instrument is the vehicle, the voice. As complex as this process is, so is the composer. The concept of time ceases to exist during the process of creativity. Writers, painters, composers, uh, dancers, choreographers, anything, sculptors, anything within the arts. If the artist is an innate artist, not a commercial, uh, with a commercial purpose, but true to his or her process, then you go through this. And it's endless days and nights. And this gets really intense sometimes, and you look for a little bit from this side, a little help. So this process demands the concept of time to disappear. 
and day and night become one. And there's just no question about that. And you can go into a studio, or uh, a music composer can go into uh, his or her studio to write their music, to pick up the guitar, to pick up the piano, and to work and work, or a painter. And you go at 2 o'clock in the afternoon, and it's 10 o'clock the next morning, you're still there. You will realize that it got dark and it got light again. It's a spectacular process. It's a difficult process. But it's a spectacular process. So this is the composer, and now I'm going to show you a painting that I did that it is the muse of music and the muse of musicians. And again, there is a very talented musician in this room. So in Greek mythology, we know that Euterpe is the muse of music. And I'd like you to see my interpretation of Euterpe, the muse of music. Solid, romantic. There is, there is a discipline to the art, the arts, painting, writing, all of the arts. It's a discipline. Life is a discipline. So there is a certain structure in, this, in the way that, that I created this piece. At the center of it is the music. The music on this painting is painted on. And this is actually a Chopin piano concerto. And any pianist can sit down and read it and play it. The burgundy is like a Merlot color, like a Merlot wine, like a Cabernet Sauvignon. Um, is the intimacy, is the romance of it, of it all. Um, creativity is that way when you're all alone with your project, with your piece. This is the circle of life. And there's another circle right here, and that is the spirit within. <coughs> this, rather than being a piece uh, like hair, is actually more of a, a halo, an aura, and that is projected onto the outside. And all the little uh, squares and rectangular, rectangular shapes and in different colors uh, is just the energy um, based on the notes that are, are here. So sometimes we see in a computer or we see on television that they're playing a piano and they have put some graphic work to it and we hear a note of a piano that goes boom and it, it lights up. So this is that part of it. This is the living tree. The energy that we call life is to the trunk of the tree. This becomes the tree of life. What is branches in all its possibilities set against a sunrise. As a norm, I don't paint sunsets. I like the beginning of a new day. I like the beginning of projects. I like the beginning. The conclusion is an accomplishment. Uh, I like the process. So I use a sunrise, a very promising sunrise, for tomorrow. And that's the optimism also. The yellow, as I said earlier, for me is the color of hope. And down at the top of the hill, it's all of us. Here we're in a circle. And. Uh, I kept the individualism in everyone. I thought about holding hands, and I said, no, let each person be an individual. Um, come as a circle of life, and I chose to silhouette the figures rather than to detail them, just to leave more to your interpretation of everyone. And you can actually place yourself in any one of these. The only thing I consciously did is I put the family here the father, the son, and a child. So this is the living tree. And this was one of the pleasures of this body of work for me. And whenever I had difficulties with a painting, I either came back to this piece or I went to another painting that we'll see a little later. And this one is La Familia 
the tree of values. Okay. This painting has gone to a private collection and it's going to a wonderful home and a wonderful family. The first thing I'd like to address here is the rain in the painting. When we are going through life and everything is wonderful, then we don't grow much, we just enjoy life. Anytime that we are challenged in any way, it, we discover abilities that we didn't know we had in, and we use them to overcome whatever obstacle, whatever rain is falling. So I brought it into the painting to prove that point and to give the male, the father, his position of protecting his family. The mother nurtures, the mother makes a lot of decisions, the mother is always very much at the center of the family, the rack of the family, and the father is usually on the outside protecting that environment and, and that family. So he is soaking wet. He doesn't mind at all. He's protecting his family. At the bottom we have the mother, um, maternal, intelligent, structured, um, with a great understanding of her children. And she has the duty that she has assumed responsibly of passing on to the children the tree of values, planting in them the seeds that will help them grow into uh, wonderful human beings tomorrow and preparing them in a way that they can be independent and that when they face society, they can function within a society outside of this society. The children are all very different. And yet, like leaves of this same tree, they're connected to one same genealogical tree. And to explain the children is basically is my pleasure because as I said to this wonderful family a couple of days ago, I said, I, I know all of these kids and they exist in me. They all exist in me. This is a young man, an adolescent, who has conflicts with himself. He doesn't really quite know who he is. So he thinks nobody else understands him. It's because no one, because he doesn't understand himself. He, he cannot project himself to others. So for the kids to be able to be understood by others, they have to know who they are first and then they can establish that with, with other people. They can establish themselves with other people. Contrary to his dilemma, as he leans against his mother for support, is his younger sister. She's younger and she, yet she knows that she wants to be in music, she wants to dance. So she begins to dress the part and she's in a world of all her own She's hearing music and she's trying to interpret it. And uh, she may or may not have had a single dance class. Um, she is in a world. I'm gonna go over here. A younger sister of theirs, and that is the one that exists in a lot of us also, that read a great deal, question a great deal, want to know the information that is supposed to be for adults. Um, so she removes a little bit herself a little bit from the rest of the family, and she's reading books that are reserved for much older people. The young boy who is 11, 12 years of age, who has a special relationship with his father, and therefore he wears the hat, and he's calling on his father, and he's not wearing the hat, and he's not wearing the hat. He's not wearing the hat is because he is an artist. He can be an architect, he can be an engineer, he can be any different professions, but he's so focused on to his work at that moment, whether it is in the arts, whether it is something else. 
He could be a chess player, anything, but he is independent for the rest of the family. He is part of the family and he stays there, but he is also completely uh, an individual. The young little, the little baby, uh, as I said, explained this painting before, babies are huge in every family. I mean, they occupy every space and every, everyone's heart. And, uh, and uh, maybe one of these other kids is doing something miraculously, miraculous, and yet if the baby walks into the room, they forget about him or her, and then the baby takes, get, grabs all of the attention. So you, he is, need to tell you, you cannot compete with babies. Just give them the space because they become big. Last but not least is there's this little girl and she's precocious, she's intelligent. She also has big questions. And I'm going to, yesterday I told the story of the teddy bear for the very first time. I'm gonna repeat it. Um, I have a teddy bear. And I have a teddy bear because I, it was given to me um, uh, when I first became an American citizen. And it was given to me by some people in an art gallery, very kindly. They went, had the teddy bear made, and it's red, white, and blue. It has tennis shoes that are red, white, and blue. And, and then when you squeeze the hand, the arm, it, it sings the, they sing, the people who gave it to me, they sing the Star Spangled Banner. So it was a really nice gesture, and I've always kept the teddy bear, and it's in my nightstand. And I told these wonderful people yesterday that when I talk to uh, my nieces and young and older, um, I have nieces who are in their early 50s. So um, they all ask where the teddy bear is. And because my name is Francisco Orlando Guadalupe Botero, I chose to name the teddy bear Francisco. So I thought that before I gave Francisco Francisco up to one of my nieces or someone in the family, I would just place him there for all eternity. And um, that's, that's, those are the children. In every painting that I do of the family, I place the books. Always in anywhere I place the books to emphasize the importance of education of children because that is their key to their tomorrows and to a sensible life. Um, I think all of you know, I don't have to quiz you on this, but I think you know that this color is optimism, is positivism, is just wonderful things to happen. And uh, this is my interpretation of La Familia, the tree of values. So this is La Primera Comunión, or the First Communion. There are some paintings in the studio that when they first appear, they are there. There is no need to go and decorate them. Sometimes there is just strong, powerful, eloquent. And when I began this work, I looked at it and uh, I thought it was eloquent to start with. There was something raw about it, something spontaneous about it. So I made a conscious decision to leave the children in a raw stage because of their age. They're just beginning. So to develop them a great deal and to paint them fully didn't make sense to me. And I left them in the white. This is actually the white you know, material. So I left them that way. I tried to give them a, a personality that appeared in both of them. Um, the young girl a little more complex than the boy. I happen to think that a lot of girls are more complex than some boys. Boys are somehow more simple. Uh, but I think girls have a complexity that is just fascinating, it's really interesting. And if we take our times and we really um, understand it, is, uh, is very, very beautiful. So I left in that way. Traditionally, it is the woman who carries the flowers and it is the man who brings the, the music instrument, musical instrument. 
I went against that. I said, why? You know, this is, we live in the 21st century also, so I think uh, I'd, I'm a strong believer and promoter of equality. I think uh, human potential has no gender, and human, uh, human potential has no race or no f religion. So I had instinctively began to place the flowers in her hand, and I was going to do the musical instrument here, and then consciously I said no. So I gave her the instrument, she is in charge of the music, and he, with all his masculinity, can carry the flowers and that is perfectly okay. Um, and in the back, there's a whole bunch of relatives, not very pretty, but they are there. We all have them. <laughs> we all have those. <laughs> uh, and then the colors in the background, red, powerful, and bold, and yellow, uh, hope, and, um, and the romanticism, and, and the faces, and the blue of, of the lady. And, uh, and I loved it. I loved it from the moment I started it. I was just really, really um, pleased with it. And that night I worked a lot, uh, but I sat a lot more. I sat in front of it. And uh, there are moments in the studio that are highly gratifying, highly gratifying. This was one of them. This is La Serenata. This is the first communion, a girl, an angel, mythological figure, comes over to serenade her. The angel has the presence of one of the flower growers. Um, he serenades her, he has taken her first communion. In return, she has a bouquet of yellow flowers. She's a precocious little girl so she doesn't want to give them to him yet until the serenade is over. So it's a surprise she has for him. She remains dressed in her attire for that day. And through a, through a very rudimentary uh, window in the back, which I consciously did not want to clean up a lot or design a lot, uh, I just wanted to be this rudimentary and then see the Andes Mountains in the background. The city of Medellin in Colombia, and I assure you that I don't work for the city of Medellin or the tourist agency, but I highly recommend that you visit someday. It's a beautiful, beautiful place. It, because of the climate condition, it's called, it's been nicknamed the city of eternal spring. So to portray that, I selected a young girl. And now we can show them the painting. So this is a young girl from that particular area, 14, 15 years of age. She is the ambassador for the city of Medellin. And because she is part of the flower growing, grower culture, she is standing over the flower fields. She has a bouquet of flowers she has picked up, which she offers to all of you which, who will be visiting Medellin in the future. Um, yellow, the color of hope. I outline discreetly the Andes Mountains. The proper lighting, you can see it in the distance. Um, this was a little difficult because uh, she needed to be fresh, she needed to be pure, and she needed to be uh, sweet and tender. And um, so as an artist, technically speaking, you can't rely on a lot of color, you cannot make up the face. You cannot use any sorts of alteration on the face. The cleaner, the more challenging, and the more beautiful. So um, this painting changed a lot throughout, throughout the time that I created this body of work. And uh, I struggled with it for some time. And then one day I was driving here in Newport Beach. And for all of you who know the area, I was driving on Jamboree Road, and it was early spring, 
and uh, I saw these trees dividing the two roads. And I looked at it, and they were just breaking into spring. And I look at this, and these mechanisms, you know, they never leave me alone. So I look at it and I said, that's exactly what the painting needs. I didn't mean to bring the trees into the painting. I just thought she needed that, and the painting needed that quality. So I went and struggled with the painting and worked with the painting, and in a few hours it began to take place. Before that, I placed the two trees as a um, reference point. And when I finished it, I decided to leave the trees there. And as I said, this has been selected for a collection in, in Denver, Colorado. So as you know, Catholic Church has Madonnas, Mary, the mother of Jesus. And there's one particular one that is matron saint of Medellin, Colombia, and the flower grows. So when I am developing this body of work, I get this idea and I get highly nervous. First of all, you have to treat that with a great deal of respect. Secondly, you have to do your own. You cannot do anything that has been done. Thirdly, it's religion. I'm not the most religious person in the world. I have a spiritual connection to the system itself. Always have had it. And I'm grateful for the early education I had in Catholicism. It has given me very nice uh, moral principles and, and a good base. Um, but at one point or another, I think all of us grow and explore. And at one time, I discover that uh, I needed to find out the truth about God and, and the need for religion. And I spent three years in the studio of painting and painting. And they told me I got very dark, but I was really removed from religion. And it dealt with religion. But I found my place. And I was very grateful for that process. So doing this painting, I was doing it from the outside, studying it, and feeling it. So I put gloves on. I read a lot. I visited the site. I sat there. I was in front of the Madonna. I felt her. Styled the Madonna of the light, and I thought, if anything, my work has always tried to accomplish throughout my life is a light, the light. So I thought it was perfect. Then I studied the legend. And before I tell you the legend, I will show you the painting. This is my interpretation of La Virgen de la Candelaria, or Madonna of the Light. Por favor. According to the Old Testament, Mary uh, brought Jesus to, to the temple, to the rabbis, for them to bless the child and to purify her. That's what women did then. When she did this, she brought a candle as a gift to them for light. And she brought the two birds symbolizing love and peace. Later on, and they're still questioning whether the light that she brought was the candle or was her son. And that uh, theologians are debating that. When I started the painting, this piece took me approximately 17 to 19 months to do. When I started the painting, I knew that she was going to be at the center and she was going to be their matron. So therefore, in the garment, flowers were a must. I designed the garment, I placed the, the flowers, I gave her an appearance that was universal, and yet it has a quality of people in that area of the world. 
for the traditional angels. And when it comes to angels, you know, when we think about the mythological angels, and this is just my viewpoint, I think that rather than thinking of the angels with the wings and, and that we hope that exist and all of that, I think we human beings have virtues and qualities that allow us to do a kind gesture for someone. And that in itself is angelical. So I believe in this. And I try to practice that. So when I went to bring the angels to the paintings, I brought the flower growers. I brought the people who move the city. I, hope I brought the people who work a day and night, who have families, who struggle, and who need this light and who need this presence. So every one of these people I know, I have met at one point or another. I place some of the flower growers at the bottom of the painting in offering their flowers to the Madonna. To some of them, I did a halo, just to emphasize on their uh, virtues and special qualities. And uh, this is a little more personal, but I have a nephew and his young wife who had twin girls. And um, the girls were about a year and a half old, beautiful girls. And they were diagnosed with um, rare blood disease. So through Harvard universities and all sorts of contacts, they discovered the doctor, uh, they found the doctor who had discovered the illness, the disease itself. And he was in Boston. So they brought the girls to Boston. And then uh, once the diagnosis had been given, uh, they said that they needed a um, bone marrow transplant. I was in contact with them, and I was really privileged because I was the only one in the entire family that knew this was taking place. I was in the studio working in this body of work, and then on August 17th of 2012, the bone marrow transplant was going to be done. So instead of going to a church or anywhere else to focus and think of them, I chose to place them in the painting. And so I put my nephew here, his young wife, and the two daughters, all of them with the flowers, as the rest of them are. And this was my hope and prayer for the girls. And uh, I didn't tell them anything about it. They know now. They have seen a photograph of the painting. And uh, it's, it's a very, I'm very happy to tell you the girls are doing extremely well and they're back in Colombia. And uh, I keep receiving photographs of them at least once a week and I talk to them via Skype. And last Christmas I flew, I was also given a special passport to go into their home in Boston. And um, I spent Christmas with them. I actually went to cook Christmas dinner for them because they were in such uh, quarantine. And it was only the four of them, and they had one lady who uh, helped them out. So I flew there, and I cooked uh, the traditional American uh, Christmas dinner, the turkey and all the trimmings. And it turned out OK. Uh, and so this painting had many different purposes for me. And uh, that was a very important one. Um, in the crown, I place the emeralds of Colombia, Colombia being the uh, greatest, uh, the largest producer of emeralds in the world. And to hold the crown, we usually see two little angels, two little boys holding the crown. I chose a little girl, and I chose a little girl from the mountains, and I chose a little girl that is an Indian girl. And um, so I gave her that position dress her in a garment similar to the other girl in the Primavera, in the Eternal Spring, and um, was the last painting that I signed. And with this, I conclude my presentation of the original paintings. I have a sculpture that I would like to show you. The base is the circle, the circle of life, and then the apple, the golden apple. And the patina is done in an antique gold, uh, which has been used through the centuries uh, when very spiritual pieces are created. 
Um, and I chose this uh, sage green color uh, for the rest of the body. The feet were important in this uh, painting because they were the base for this. As, a, as a, in the sculpting, I don't do what maybe other sculptors can do, which is they take some materials, uh, chicken wire or foam core or other materials, and then they create the sculpture and then they cover it with um, clay or plastiline or whatever. Uh, I don't do that. I always go the long route. Uh, and so I began this with two little blocks of clay. And I began to build and build and build and build. But in my mind and in my center, I thought this is the way life is. We built it. So I couldn't look at from the outside, have an idea when I'm going to do this and, uh, and then develop it. it. It cuts into the exploration process. I like exploring the, the piece, the sculpture, the painting. I need to. So this is the tree of life. And I am done with the presentation. <laughs> Thank you.